I'm Polly. I'm a mom, a wife, a pelvic floor physical therapist, and founder of No Kegels University. I have helped thousands of women stop leaking, enjoy intimacy, and feel proud of their bodies, even after having kids. After years of listening to women wonder why no one talks about leaking, how they should properly recover after having a baby, and that pleasurable intimacy is possible, I started to get real frustrated because I believe that no mom or woman should struggle when there are answers. It became my mission to shed light on the lack of postpartum care and the lack of discussion on issues that relate to women and their health, even if they can be uncomfortable sometimes. It also became my mission to change the conversation on women's health, the pelvic floor, and more. Here we go. Episode 20, Treatment Options for Endometriosis. A few weeks ago, I reached out to our physician because our family had just been feeling crummy for the past three months. We had all sorts of symptoms, and if one of us didn't have it, then another one of us did. And during the course of this conversation with him, he asked me a lot of questions, which is one of the reasons that I chose him as a physician, because I think he's very thorough and I really appreciate his approach. Besides the fact that he lets us decide and encourages us to decide what the best course of treatment or what our choices look like and that he will support us in that. And during the line of questioning, after I told him the symptoms we were experiencing and my concerns, at one point he started asking questions that I was kind of annoyed about because I didn't feel like they had anything to do with what I was telling him. I almost felt like he wasn't hearing me. And when we got done, he started to tie it together with the story that I had told him and what he thought we were experiencing. And then he gave us a couple of treatment options. And the the part of the story that I thought was, I well, at least I was annoyed with was he asked me, well, do you, do you feel like your symptoms and your family's symptoms, do they follow the lunar cycle? And I thought, if you ask me what all of our signs are, I might hang up this phone. And it turns out we ended up having a parasite and parasites, their life cycle followed the lunar cycle. Not that they're necessarily related, or at least to my understanding, but that's the, that was the part I got annoyed with because I'm telling him about how we feel crummy. And I just didn't think that feeling crummy in the lunar cycle was related in my limited knowledge of the body or at least our immune systems and such. And then when it came time for the treatment options, he presented us a couple and he provided one that I felt was much more affordable than what I thought it would be. And to be honest, part of that protocol felt a little outside my comfort zone because getting my family to follow a protocol for three months (laughs) I felt like that might be a little overwhelming and something that I may or may not be able to do consistently 100% of the time. But the, but I tell you that because I am really confident that, or at least at the time anyways, I, maybe now I can say I feel more confident because we've been doing this protocol for almost two weeks and we feel significantly better and none of us have felt crummy since we started. But I bring up that part of, I didn't necessarily understand where he was going, but I gave him the opportunity to tie everything together in a bow and give us some treatment options. And even though one of them felt outside of our comfort zone a little bit, I also felt like it was totally doable. And that is kind of the premise that I want to set for today's episode that I I want you to have lots of information and I want you to be encouraged to go research what it is that 
I might be sharing with you so that you know the best options. Because that is that, I mean, that was part of my story with this entire parasite and the protocol. I went and I did some of my own research because I wanted to make sure what he was saying didn't have a level of bias, but I wanted to make sure that what he suggested to us was going to work. And I made sure that I also looked at reputable sites, some that maybe were biased, but I looked at the other end of that uh, spectrum of being biased. I looked at both sides of it. And I really want that to be the premise for today. And while my physician might have been a little bit biased in how he was presenting the information. He's also doing some of it based on his own experience, which from my perspective, that's what I'm trusting. He's been in the field for a very long time and has had incredible success rates with his patients. Um, He's a family physician and there's many, many reasons I chose him. But I also wanted to present that to you that I have a lot of experience in this, not only personally, but professionally as well. So if you feel like I might have a bias coming through, go look at the other side of the bias. I I encourage you to do that because at the end of the day, the way I take a look at, and not that this is like a, a healthcare conversation, but anything related to your health you should go and research. You should go and know and have a good understanding of what is presented to you so that you can make the best choice. So with that, let me tell you the five treatment options for endometriosis. The first is surgery, and this can be broken up into a cauterization surgery or an excision surgery, and they're different. The cauterization surgery, this is where they go in laparoscopically and they burn off the endo lesions. And this is what they did for a really long time. But unfortunately, the recurrence rate, um, it, <laughs> it is a little high with it. And the other option that they have uh, been doing recently. I don't know how long, but this is where they go in and they actually remove the entire lesion. So think of this like cutting down a tree, but the roots are still there or pulling out a weed, if you will, but the roots are still there compared to pulling out a weed or taking out the entire tree, its trunk and its roots. They're two totally different solutions And this is something that I would encourage you to look into because as of now, the excision is where recurrence rates are really, really, really low. The second option is birth control. And there are some that believe that um, supplementing your hormones with birth control can be a way to suppress the endometriosis symptoms. And this is one that a lot of research has really refuted. And in my professional experience, it's one that I haven't had that many patients have a lot of success with it, but it's one where, and I, and I briefly mentioned this in the story in the beginning of this episode, that finances and something that I could do was part of my decision in agreeing to that protocol that my doctor suggested. And I do have some patients right now that are utilizing birth control because it's a way to manage some of their symptoms while they are saving up for surgery or while they're trying to get into a different place in life or their circumstances that might be preventing them from going forward with the surgery at the time. But the other, my other sisterly advice that I would add here is please research the effects of birth control and not just the increased blood pressure, increased risk of clots, go deeper. There's a lot more research that as I have discussed with friends and patients that they are surprised to learn some of these effects. And I'm not intentionally trying to 
lead you on or make this sound suspenseful, but I really would encourage you to go dig a little bit deeper on this one. The third treatment option is pelvic floor physical therapy. And yes, I might be very biased on this, but where I have endometriosis myself, this is an area that I see that my pelvic floor doesn't always do what it should because of the effects of endometriosis. And I have many patients that come to see me for endometriosis and its related symptoms and limitations. And it is incredible to me to watch these patients start to increase their activity level, to increase their quality of life as I'm able to help them with their bodies so that they can start performing in the way that they would prefer them to do. And in later episodes, I'll discuss this a little more at length, but stay tuned to the end for some more information on this that will be a free resource to you upcoming in this month of March. The fourth treatment option is diet. And this is one that I feel like gives you a ton of control over your symptoms, but I'll be honest, it's one that not many are willing to implement, which really breaks my heart because as I present this information, and I don't want to say it's an affordable option because inflation is a thing right now, but it's something that you can easily change up your habits that you have control, you have power over to better understand what your body is doing with the food that you're giving to it. And I strongly believe, and this is coming from my background in dietetics, I have a bachelor's degree in it, and it's an area that I feel like is very neglected, especially as it relates to endometriosis, because personally, I have seen changes in my symptoms based on the nutrients that I give it or don't give it. And the patients of mine that are willing to go make changes here have also seen the benefits of it. And while I understand that food is also meant to be enjoyed, I also think that it is meant to be a drug and it can be used as a drug for good or for bad. And the advice that I'll give you here is I think there's a lot of suggestions out there that you should follow a FODMAP diet or reduce your foods that are inflammatory to you. But what I would suggest for you to do is take start taking a food journal and journaling your symptoms. And I think you'll notice that there is power in your patterns. And I think a lot of people will think, oh no, that's not it. But I'm here to tell you that I think it's different for everyone. My metabolism and the way in which I process food is different than the way your body does it. So I could list out all sorts of inflammatory foods, but I also think that it's easier if you can do it yourself. Not to say that the burden is on you, but I also think if I were to give you a list or you went and looked up a list of all the inflammatory foods, I think you would feel really deprived rather than journaling your food and seeing what might be inflammatory to you. And uh, my limited knowledge on genetics and nutrition, because that is a heavy, heavy and deep and multifaceted topic. It's one where how your body reacts to food is going to be different. And I think it's a really powerful journey that would be in your best interest to take. And the fifth option is exercise. And before you stop this episode, let me clarify, because when I present some of these options, to my patients or coaching clients, they straight panic and start listing off all the excuses, how they've tried exercising and it doesn't work. But let's go back a little bit and maybe we don't call it exercise, 
Maybe we just call it movement of the body. And I I want to rephrase that because I think the word exercise, we think that we need to go exercise or move our body vigorously for an hour and sweat and be out of breath and be exhausted. And if you're in the middle of an endo flare, that is the last thing on your list. But I know that you know that line from Legally Blonde where they say something to the effect of, well, exercise gives you endorphins. Happy people just don't kill people. And it's in reference to that exercise gives you endorphins and endorphins make you happy and happy people just don't kill people. And which I I love that movie, by the way, it always makes me smile or laugh out loud. But the point of that is if your body can have a few hits of endorphins from body movement, that's pain-free, you will reap the benefits because think of the last time you were in an endo flare and chances are you were probably laying in bed, laying in the bath, being very still and your muscles are going to become, I always think of Play-Doh that's been left out for too many days, but I also want you to think about when you have more blood flow to an area, you have more nutrients, you have more oxygen moving there. And the beautiful thing about that is there's healing that happens. And with that healing We also are thinking about your pelvic floor. We're thinking about your pelvic cavity and we're thinking about your abdominal cavity. We want healing. We want the inflammation that tends to stick around with endo to be lessened, minimized, or even gone completely. And when you're in pain, if you have some positive hits of endorphins from movement that is pain-free, then as a result, you're going to feel a little bit better. It might take some of the edge of the pain and, and the discomfort off. And I could go on and on here to the benefits of body movement or exercise, but I also want to address probably the lingering question that you're probably thinking, okay, so what does this even look like if I'm just laying in bed and walking is too much? Well, the cool thing about that is it's an area that I have been exploring with a lot of my patients and trying some different programming, and it has been really incredible to see patients start to love their bodies and to start to utilize body movement or exercise or however you want to call it as a way to manage their pain. And At the end of this month in March, I have a program that will be going out free to you. It's called Thrive with Endo Exercise Series, and I want you to sign up for it. But before we get to that, let me tell you a little bit more. I think this is an area where even if you might be curious as to what I'm saying or or even suggesting here, you might be feeling like it's a hopeless case for you because you've tried so many things before. But I also think that the type of movement that you're doing and the reason or logic or rationale behind it might not been robust enough to support the reason that you chose to do whatever said movement. And if I lost you there, what I mean is, I have endo, I have patients that have endo, and like I said, I have been doing some different exploring with different programming for my patients, because I have patients that can't even walk into the clinic upright because they are in so much pain, and by doing a little bit of exercise here with a really great rationale and really great reasoning behind the programming, they walk out of the clinic upright, smiling, and in less pain. And the beautiful thing about it is that the time in between, they're doing exercises that I have a really great reason for them doing, 
to help increase blood flow to certain areas, to utilize the hit of endorphins, if you will, that we're going to get from moving our bodies. And they can do these exercises in a pain-free way. So I hope that piques your curiosity and I hope that that gives you at least a, a different consideration behind moving your body while you're in an endo flare or exercise while you're in an endo flare or how, whatever term you want to use, but that is a treatment option that can serve you as you're trying to manage your symptoms. So with that, the homework for this episode is to sign up in the show notes for the Thrive with Endo exercise series. And at the end of this month, March, I'll send you a four week program. It'll get sent to you every week for four weeks of exercises, no matter what stage of endo you are experiencing. And if you're listening to this episode, just out of curiosity, If you have chronic pain, if you have digestive issues that keep you from participating in exercise, this would be a really great option for you as well. And if you can't wait till the end of March, please sign up for a personalized pelvic floor plan where you and I can discuss this, these same principles and get a little more specific to you and your needs. And remember, You're an heiress and a queen and everything in between. If you enjoyed this episode or even wondered if I can help you, check the show notes for more details. And to see what else I'm up to, follow me on the socials at beyond the V period by Polly. Because I'm changing the conversation on women's health, the pelvic floor and more, I still need your help. Please subscribe, leave a review and share with a friend or two. See you next week.